Hey, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. I'm actually not on the farm today. I've taken a road trip down to Oregon, St. Paul, Oregon, and you may recognize this guy. This is Ben from Heirloom Roses. He's been kind enough to give me a tour of their production facilities here and offer us some rose growing tips that I think you will find useful to up your game on growing great roses. So this is our propagation. It's our head house where we take, we process all of our cuttings. We take cuttings from three different places off of our liners we produce mm -hmm. off, of, uh, off of our field. Uh, stock fields and then off of our inventory right and so yeah so they process those all into there into a 70 cell tray flat and then they go into a, our inventory system starts right there okay and so we know wherever what every cutting that we've taken where it's at yeah and then uh, as we move them along through the process we know what our take is and Perfect. all of that they'll be they'll be working on this until September uh, towards the end of September we'll stop propagating now, I guess with a mild climate uh, like this, you have lots of time for rooting. Yeah, we do, although, you know, it's dry. So right now is our challenge is keeping things cool. Yep. And then uh, we'll get into some colder months, but yeah, like, yeah, like we're, we're not so dissimilar from your climate up yeah. there. So yeah. uh, these are all, uh, this is all of our propagation along here. So all of these houses are set up with mist, bent, <clears throat> mist tables. We don't use bottom heat. We don't need it. Um, if it gets cold, we just heat the entire house. Yeah. And for the amount of time we're doing it, it's... Not the most efficient, but we don't do it very long. And so all of the liners you see here are, uh, they're waiting to go into transplanting. And we're from, we're now, every, uh, the houses have emptied out and we're going in and, uh, and consolidating and cleaning and getting things ready for. I noticed a fairly, yeah. uh, a fair bit of shade on your prop houses. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, that's I guess keeping the, things cool. Yeah, the temperatures would be uh, uh, way too high, I guess. Yeah. This is uh, early canning this year. So this is our first canning in April. Those would be saleable next spring then. And we, we, we typically will go through and we'll, we'll cut back and prune at least four times before they become saleable. So total schedule from propagation year one, you're taking cuttings all the way through the summer. Yeah. Put them in the liners, hold yep. them over the winter, mm -hmm. get them nice and big and beefy, take mm -hmm. some cuttings off of them maybe, mm -hmm. and then uh, potting year two into one gallon? Yes. Yep. I, I think on average it's 16 months is what we hold the plant. A little longer, a little shorter. I mean, a little shorter is if you hit the weather and the timing just perfectly. Right. You know, so yeah. uh, an early canning with a warm spring, you might be able to get finished up a little sooner. We just finished this potting out here. This was our most recent one. And uh, and then we're going through, back through and canning all of these houses now with our second round. We have, with, with space requirements, you know, we gotta, we can't do everything all at once, so it's two phases. And so uh, early spring, and then coming back through and doing a, a midsummer canning like we're doing now. That's a lot of plants. Yeah. So these are actually, we, we've, they're gonna have a cover over them like those. So we've planted them in the configuration that the greenhouse will be there and then we'll come back through and build the greenhouses over them. Actually, they're not really greenhouses, they're just to keep the plants dry. Right. Yeah. yeah get, get control over the, the rainfall. Yeah, we just don't want them leaching out the plants yeah. with so much rain. So fertile, uh, fertile soil of uh, River Valley in a famously easy area of the world to grow roses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you we, we, this, is, this is the this is the 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 valley soil here in the it's French Prairie is what this is called. Uh, the, the it's great soil. Yeah, it's a it's a shame to actually put greenhouses on it, but um, things do really well on the ground here. And these are so a lot of these plants out here, these ones that are recently pruned, we've we've knocked them back, and we say it's 60 days from prune to bloom, and so those are so that we can take cuttings in September right before. Uh, things go dormant so and this is just one of our stock fields we have another one out that way that's um, we try to keep we, we keep one of everything preferably two of everything uh, so we have a lot of genetics out here we probably have four four thousand varieties of roses out here some of them are out of production some of them are off patent some of them are not licensed to grow anymore but we, we hold on to them because stuff comes back around Got a chance to go up to the uh, International Test Garden. Oh yes, while we were coming through. Uh -huh. It's beautiful up there. It really is. I mean, that's that's one of the things Portland's known for. 
Okay, I just had to pop right into the video for one second here to talk about that International Rose Test Garden in Portland. If you're ever in Oregon, it's very worth a visit. Over 10,000 individual roses, over acres of property. I'll give you a map and I'll also include some pictures and some footage here as well as much as I can. Uh, the reason I mention that at this point is that Heirloom Roses itself, well, uh, equally impressive in my mind, is not open to the public. They're a working nursery, working hard to put lots of roses into your gardens across the country. And because of that, they're not open for tours. Uh, ben and the team were kind enough to take and allow me a walk around and to spare some time while I was down there on vacation. Uh, but if you're ever heading to the Portland area, it is that international test garden that you'll want to set as your destination. A worthwhile substitute, I would say. So for those who are not as lucky to live in uh, the perfect rose growing region, mm -hmm. Sun? Yeah, so you know, we say minimum six hours of sun, and with, if you get below that, you're really pushing it. I have some roses at my home that are, I have a climbing rose in a container, and it's, it gets six hours, but it is also, you can see it reaching yeah. and uh, getting a little lanky. So, right. yeah, the more sun, the better. And I tell people, it, roses can handle the hot weather, they just need the, the appropriate amount of water to go with it. Right. And so that's where you're just, you know, it starts getting hot, really watch your, watch your watering. Yeah. and uh, make sure they're getting enough. And what are your thoughts on mulch? Well, I think mulch is great. Um, we would be mulching things a lot more here. At home, I have thick mulch, four inches at least. Right, keep um, consistent moisture. Keeps consistent moisture in the ground. It also builds up the mycorrhiza in the ground and you just get a lot better soil health that way. And uh, they, the plants just do a lot better. Right, Yeah. now fertility, obviously it's gonna be very different in different regions, mm -hmm. but in general, roses do perform better if they get lots of nutrition yes yes yeah um i am a big proponent of liquid fertilizer that being said i mean we use granular fertilizer on older plants but i think liquid feed the, the it, it gets down into the plant better if you're using a fish emulsion i think that's a that's a really good way to go um i, I think the plant utilizes it better and i think you can water water and fertilizer late into the fall Right. And you keep that fertility in the plant up. Right. It, it, and you it, can it, see it, the results, right? Yeah. It's, you know, really it's nothing better than watching what the rose is doing. Yeah. Seeing if the uh, leaves are a healthy green color and mm -hmm. pushing flowers. And then, then mm -hmm. you can react a, mm -hmm. a little bit, a little bit up, a little down. Yeah. Easy to do with a liquid feed. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to see our plant health team out here. Oh, fantastic. She's, uh, she's doing actually, she's, she's counting inventory. We're always on top of inventory. It's the biggest thing because everything links to the website live. Yep. And so when we're can counting and moving plants, it's it's a uh, really important. No one moves things without it being counted, and we know where it's at. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of plant health, uh huh. Uh, roses get all the. Uh, all the well-known, all the usual suspects as mm -hmm. far as, uh, as uh, pests go. Yeah. Um, what's your approach to pest control here? I mean, is it sort of a watch and see? <laughs> well, so if from a nursery operation standpoint, we don't, we use pesticides only one time when, we, when a plant comes into the nursery, it goes into a quarantine process and we treat it with pest control, uh, pesticides, whatever we need to do to make sure that it's clean. After that, we don't use any pesticides in our operation. It's all beneficial insects. We don't build up any resistance that way, and it just we just have a really good, healthy environment that way. Now you have to be on top of it all right. the time, and you're also putting out all of these tiny little, you know, nematodes and things that you can't see. And I was like, oh, they're really there, but it works really well. We're just always on top of it, and I'll show you some containers and things that we put out that uh, where we're leasing those all the time in an environment. It's a little more difficult to do in your yard because things aren't as contained, but I still think you can do it. Right, and yeah. I guess you'd also say that the people who have a a mixed garden have mm -hmm. some advantages of natural predators mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. uh, and again it's not something you instantly always see the results of if you're having a little aphid outbreak yeah uh, but you know if you leave them alone and let the predators do what they do 90 plus percent of the time that aphid outbreak will be short-lived yeah and like an aphid outbreak too you can, you can go through your hose and you know <laughs> devastate the aphids and just blast them off. Exactly. You know, being careful with your with new blooms, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no heavy chemical ne means needed for those. That's right, yeah, yeah. And we do overhead water everything. Um, 
we just time it right so that it all dries during the day. Mm -hmm. Everything's getting watered early in the morning. And so early morning water. Early, mo early morning water, dry by noon. Sometimes the stock fields will wa we'll water those a little bit later, but uh, yeah. And then we have liquid feed. We, we inject liquid feed in, so each house has a fortified line and a fresh line. Now, control. I, I do notice on your roses here, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the crops I've been walking past look like they've been uh, freshly clipped, mm -hmm. handled a lot. I think you mentioned your team is pretty much going through them four times yeah. from cutting all the way to sale. You're, you're, you're pruning them. We're, we're tipping them back, and what that does is it promotes uh, branching and basal break. And so we want both of those things to happen so you get a better shaped plant. And then also we try to keep the blooms off. It's really sad, you'll see blooms around now, but typically blooms invite bugs. And so in, the, in a nursery environment, we, don't, we try to keep the blooms to a minimum. Although we always let plants bloom out a complete cycle so that you can make sure that there's no, no mix ups on varieties, <laughs> which is really difficult to control uh, when you're transplanting and moving a lot of plants. So right. it's another quality control thing we do. For sure. Yeah. They're, they're working through the stock fields now. They're either taking cuttings and moving them over to propagation or they're uh, going through and hoeing out the rows and just cleaning up weeds and, you know, the ongoing maintenance of rose, roses. It's one of my favorite places in the nursery. <laughs> yeah, I can see why. Look at this. Yeah. So we actually, the, we, 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 it's not like a garden. The, plant, the, the, the grass and stuff down the center is all a cover crop, and so it's a mixed, different type of crop that we'll let grow up. Sometimes we till it out. And we're always doing different things with it to kind of help the whole environment of the garden out there. Here, this is the last group of houses we'll consolidate. I have heat for these houses, so sometimes we'll, we'll keep things growing a little bit into this fall with some heat, although we don't, it's expensive to run heat and I don't really like to. No, sure. As little as we have to, but At yeah. what temperature do you really consider it uh, dangerous? Like you, we're... Well, I'm not so concerned about dangerous. Like we've, we've had it four degrees for a week out here. Yeah. And the, we'll, we'll, if that happens, we'll go through and run the water because we know it's coming and we'll freeze all the roots and they're fine. Mm -hmm. So we, I, it's, it's actually like I let we, all the roses go dormant. Yeah. And it's like putting the kids to bed. It's like, okay, they don't need care. They don't need maintenance. We can just take a little breather. It's actually kind of nice. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So we run the heat actually to keep things growing. So if things are not quite to size and we're coming into October, we'll run the heat at night a little bit just to kind of keep things growing along. Yeah. Uh, that's the most important things. If we get snow, we'll run the heat. Right. But a lot of my houses don't have, have, have heat in them, so if, it, if we get more than four inches of snow, yeah. we come out and clean all the houses yeah, you, off. you're shoveling them off. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for coming with me on this tour in St. Paul, Oregon. Wonderful site here. You would not believe the look of their stock fields and their production facilities. It's amazing. Uh, had a great time. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to drop them into the comments below the video. I'll see what I can do to help.